Father, what we have sung is indeed our desire today for you to shed light upon your word. We know that this is not some kind of a mystical experience whereby you give us some kind of a, a strange uh, warm feeling, but you gradually help us to understand how the pieces of your word fit together like a puzzle. There's some parts of puzzles that are easy to identify and we can set up the, the border fairly easy, be easily because we see the straight edges of pieces and it doesn't take too long to fit those things together. And similarly, there are many things in the Bible that are straightforward. But then there are pieces of sky or a dark piece of ground and it takes a long time for us to put those things in place. And there are things in the Bible also that are a little harder to figure out. And you have said in your word that it is the business of kings to be able to perceive these more difficult matters and we know that we do not come to the scriptures as orphans without guidance from the Lord Jesus Christ. He has sent his spirit to live in every believer in him and he has uh, come to abide in us and never to leave us and he has come to teach us. And so we pray that he will have freedom to do that and help us to be observant as we look at these passages of scripture and uh, see what they say and to take them at your word. Help me to be faithful in expositing this passage and uh, would you encourage us as we go into the week. Uh, we, we're living in a world uh, filled with chaos and uh, rumors of war and uh, conflict and there are many uncertainties. We thank you that you have given us the certainties of your promises that we can rely upon as we go into the week in our separate duties and so we pray that you will help us in our time of Bible study and teach each one of us, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Some years ago, a uh, good friend of ours who comes from a conservative church that is not of our particular doctrinal persuasion spent uh, the evening with us in Luxembourg. He was just passing through. He had been working with a nonprofit association to try to influence governments in certain directions. He had for a long time been a representative for the United States government with the um, European Union in Brussels. He's a, he's a great fellow and we've appreciated fellowship with him for uh, quite a number of years. And we were speaking in the evening in our home in Luxembourg about uh, some of his concerns about the church that the church fellowship and denomination that he's a part of. And we discussed some, some differences between where that church stood and the kinds of things that we were presenting in the church in Luxembourg. And uh, in the course of the conversation, I said, so, uh, so what do you see as the big differences between Christian Community Church and your own church background. And uh, he crossed his legs and uh, he paused for a moment and he said, well, for one thing, I don't believe in the rapture. And I don't remember exactly where the conversation went after that. Um, we've always had many theological conversations together and he's very sharp on these things and he knows something about church history and so I'm sure that it was a, a profitable discussion. But I knew what he meant because I knew his background and we'd spent a good deal of time together. He did not mean that he didn't believe in the resurrection of believers to eternal life. Because he believed in the resurrection of believers to eternal life and he believed in the bodily return of Jesus Christ. He was absolutely committed to this. What he meant was that he believed that Jesus would return 
followed by a general judgment of all people in the world in history. He did not believe that Jesus would return in the clouds to take the church to be with himself and then return with the church to set up the kingdom. He believed that the kingdom was already here in some sense and that believers are called to reign now as Christ's emissaries as we await his return. He expected that the world would become a very grim, dark place as time rolls along before Jesus' return. But his expectation was that the church would go through all of that uh, period of darkness and judgment upon the world with everybody else. So if you were sitting in our dining room over a cup of coffee and we had a conversation about that, how would you express what you believe about the return of Jesus Christ? I'm not asking you for an to stand up one after the other and answer that question, but think about it in your own mind. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, Paul writes to Titus, who is a, an apostolic delegate on the island of Crete, just south of Greece, and talks about the fact that he, along with Titus and all believers in Crete, are looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking for the blessed hope. What is the blessed hope? Is the historical Jesus actually going to come back in a body, in a glorified body, unlike, for example, Muhammad or the Buddha or Joseph Smith or anyone else who has ever launched a human religion? Is Jesus actually going to come back? It's really a rather revolutionary idea, you know. I, I'm probably a little dense, but I can't think of any other religion that actually makes the claim that the founder of that belief system, after he dies, is actually going to come back and rule over the world in, in, in a human body. Do, do you know of any such religion that makes that claim? It's unique. If he's going to return, how will it occur? And does it make any difference in the way we live? We've been doing a series at uh, Pastor Sam's request on eschatology, that is what the Bible says about future events. And we have already looked at a couple of passages, one in Luke 21, which talks about Jesus' prediction of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, particularly the temple, and some of the events that followed. Last time we were together, we talked about the tribunal, the bema seat of Christ, where believers' works will be assessed, will be judged. Not believers themselves, but a man's works will be judged, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And some will receive a reward and some will not receive the reward that they could have had. Beginning this afternoon and going forward a number of months, Lord willing, we want to talk about the theme of what is generally called the rapture of the church. The term rapture that is used in Bible studies and popular uh, treatments of this question is not a biblical term per se. You can't go to a, a New Testament or Old Testament passage and find the word rapture uh, listed in the concordance. It's not there. It is derived from uh, the Latin Vulgate, Latin, the Latin translation of the Bible, which in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 uh, translates a verb harpazo to mean to snatch up, and it translates it with the 
uh, Latin word rapiemur, we will be caught up. So when we're talking about the rapture, we're talking about the catching away, the, if you want to be very popular about it, the, the snatch, the taking out of the world at some point. Now, my friend who said he didn't believe in the rapture would have a very difficult time saying that the notion of the rapture is not in Scripture because it really is, <laughs> very definitely. And later on in the month of May, when Pastor Sam will be in Madrid, he's asked me to go ahead and keep this going in his absence, and we will talk about another passage that deals with this theme. But I'd like to start with a passage in John's Gospel, chapter 14, because um, the Scripture is um, very clear that Jesus did predict the rapture of the church. I believe it's clear, and I'd like to try to convince you, if, if you have questions about that, that Jesus Christ did indeed predict not just His return, which of course He did predict, but a particular aspect of His return. Um, we need to look, first of all, at the larger context of this prediction. And before we do that, I would just like to um, remind us of a couple of places where the verb translated to rapture out, to catch away, where that verb is used in the New Testament, because it's not just found in the letters of Paul or other letters. I think of in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 11, we see Jesus' statement that there are religious leaders in Judaism who try to take the kingdom of heaven away from those who are ready for it. They, they pull it away. They kind of pull the rug out from underneath them. It's the, this verb, harpazo. They yank it away. They do violence. One chapter later in Matthew 12, 29, Jesus uses the parable of the a person who tries to go into a house and binds the strong man and then carries off his property to carry away, to harpazo, that the property is to snatch it away from the place where normally it would belong. One chapter further in Matthew 13, in the famous parable of the uh, four kinds of soil, in verse 19, it talks about the birds snatching away the seed out of the ground. The sower sows the seed, it goes into different kinds of soil, and the first kind of soil is not prepared at all, it's filled with rocks, it's walked upon by people, and in that kind of a soil you put seed on, the birds are going to come and say, it's dinner time, and they snatch it, arpazo, they snatch it away, they catch it off and enjoy their lunch. In John chapter 10, verse 12, it is used of a wolf who snatches away the sheep. Jesus is dealing with the blind man, you will remember, in those several chapters. And the blind man is healed, and he's hauled before the religious leaders who say to him, uh, we understand that you were healed on the Sabbath. Everybody knows it's, on, it's illegal to heal people on the Sabbath. Tut, tut. Uh, who is the man who healed you? I'm not quite sure who it was. But I know one thing, that I used to be blind, and now I can see. And in chapter 10, Jesus talks about the fact that this man, who is going to be, along with his parents, cast out of the synagogue, might be rejected by people, but he is secure in the hand of the Lord Jesus and of his Father. No man can snatch believers out of the Father's hand, and no man can snatch them out of my hand. John 10, verse 12, John 10, verse 28. In a slightly different uh, sense, it is used in Acts chapter 8 of the, Philip, uh, of the evangelist Philip. You remember how he was dealing with the Ethiopian eunuch. And after the Ethiopian eunuch said, um, explain this passage to me so that I can believe. Philip explained to him Isaiah chapter 53. The Ethiopian eunuch expressed faith in the message and said, there's a, some water, what keeps me from being baptized? Philip baptized him in water. And after that, the Ethiopian eunuch got back into his chariot and headed back south to Africa. 
And the text says, says that God snatched <clears throat> Philip away and took him to Gaza. Same word. Or 2 Corinthians 12, verse 4. Paul says, I was snatched away to the third heaven. Jude chapter, uh, well, there's only one chapter. Jude verse 23 talks about snatching something out of the fire. Always, harpazo. Revelation 12 verse 5, the child of the woman, Israel, is caught up to God and his throne. A reference to Jesus' resurrection and ascension. You see that this is not just a unique word only used with regard to the um, rapture of the church as, in, as, it, as it is in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, and we'll look at that uh, the next time we're together. But it is a word that has a very consistent meaning, and it can have several contexts, but it is always a very determined, in some cases violent, but aggressive uh, action that removes physically something from somewhere or some people from somewhere. Please bear in mind that there are no Old Testament passages on this topic. Could be an allusion to it in uh, Genesis chapter 5 where we see that Enoch uh, was not begot because God took him. And some might say, well, there is a, an analogous situation with the prophet Elijah who goes up into heaven in a chariot and he's taken away without ever having died. But the actual term is never used in the Old Testament. This is new information never revealed to Old Testament prophets, just as the destruction of the city of Jerusalem by the Romans in, in Luke 21 was never revealed in the Old Testament, or the creation of the church, according to Ephesians chapter 3, this was never revealed to the Old Testament prophets. It's a new piece of information that God has given to his apostles, particularly the Apostle Paul. So the rapture of the church is a new revelation given by Jesus and also to the Apostle Paul to believers who would form a new body after the day of Pentecost. So I want us to take some time to think about this together. And in the coming sessions, I want to think about the theme of uh, the rapture of the church from a group of other passages, uh, including 1 Thessalonians 4 and Revelation 3. So, let's go to John chapter 14 in your Bible, and I would like you to read with me verses 1 to 3. John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. These are familiar words to us, I think. But we always need to remember that the Holy Spirit, in inspiring these texts, has always given us the context and so we need to back into chapter 13, which is the beginning of this section where Jesus is spending time with his apostles and disciples in the upper room, uh, ready to take the Passover. If you look at chapter 13, verse 1, you'll see a very significant statement that's made. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them to the end. I want to underscore this phrase, he should depart out of this world unto the Father. <coughs> Furthermore, in verses 21 to 30, we see how the Lord Jesus, in getting ready for the Passover, uh, deals with Judas Iscariot. We're not going to read all of these verses for reasons of time. But what happens is that 
in the process of the Passover, Jesus gives the piece of the Passover, which is called in, uh, in older English, the sop. To, he gives the sop to Judas. This is the choice morsel. This is the best piece of meat that you can carve off the rib. Uh, this is the, the place for the honored guest who is seated at Jesus' right hand. Jesus gives Judas, his betrayer, the best piece of the Passover meal, and then Jesus says, um, what you must do, do quickly. And the text tells us in verse 30 that he then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. That's a grim statement, and John includes it here because he certainly sees this as being a, a, let's not call it a premonition, but very symbolic of what is going to happen. This is a, a gesture of honor given to the one who is going to betray the Lord Jesus. And we pick up the reading in verse 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you. In other words, what I said to the Jews earlier on, wherever I'm going, you cannot come. I'm going to repeat the same thing to you. Where I'm going, you cannot come. And then verse 34, in light of the fact that he is soon going to be absent, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to the other. In verses 36 to 38, Peter engages the Lord on this comment. with an objection. And we understand Peter, don't we? He, 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 he's quick to respond, and there's an emotional bubbling in his character which allows him immediately to take on Jesus' comment and question it or to challenge it. And sometimes he says some very silly things the way we would if we were in his shoes. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Where are you going? Now, that's a particularly appropriate question. If Jesus has spent three years with you in public ministry and now tells you, I'm leaving, what would you say? You would say, where are you going? <laughs> uh, this is news. W what do you mean you're leaving? What do you mean, love each other as I have loved you, and, and you're going to depart? Where are you going? Jesus answered him, whither I go, thou canst not follow me now. That's exactly what he has said earlier in the, in the paragraph. But thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why, why can't I follow thee now? I have laid down my life for your sake. Peter's not quite sure what is going on here, but he's, he's willing to follow Jesus right to the end. I mean, even if it means death to my body, I will go the whole distance with you. And Jesus says this ominous thing in verse 38. Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Peter, I appreciate, no, forgive me for paraphrasing this. I appreciate your expressions of loyalty, but let's be realistic. You're going to deny me. And, uh, how ironic is this, that Judas, who is going to betray the Lord, has already left for 30 pieces of silver, which is really a pittance. And Peter, who has stayed, is going to deny that, the Lord Jesus, that he knows the Lord Jesus before the cock crows, which is going to happen uh, early the next morning. The chapter division, 
I would like you just to kind of set aside in your mind because chapter 14, verse 1, continues immediately after Jesus' prediction of Peter's denial. Peter, you're going to deny me three times, but let not your heart be troubled. That's the context of this encouraging word from the Lord Jesus, which launches us into the promise of Jesus' coming. I want you to notice a couple of things as we work through these three verses that Jesus says about his coming back. Let's take them one after the other. He says in verse 2 that in his father's house are many mansions, and had this not been the case, Jesus would have told them a long time ago, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. It is obvious in the flow of the thought that Jesus is going to go to the Father's house. Where is he going that the disciples and the Jewish leaders cannot come? He's going to the Father's house. An echo of chapter 13, verse 1. Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, was preparing to leave this world and to go to his Father. These verses, 13.1 and 14.1-3, fit together perfectly. Now, what's surprising about the Father's house is that it's not just a place for the Father. You know, down here in Marbella, or other places that maybe are not quite as swank, there are huge mansions which are owned by very wealthy people who visit them maybe once a year for a week to get away from the paparazzi, or um, maybe uh, family members that are not easy to live with. And they have these huge places, and I, I wonder where they spend most of their time, because let's face it, I don't know if you've given this much thought when you buy a piece of real estate, but most of us spend uh, most of our time in the kitchen, the bathroom, and the bedroom. And even that, probably those three rooms, to have them under one roof would be a luxury. There are some people who don't even have that much. And if you've got a place that is just worth a hundred million of any currency, you don't really need all of that space. And if you are the child of a billionaire and you say, I'm going to go visit my father's pad in Marbella and it's just for me, you might say, how big is it? How much space do you need? Obviously, the Father, the Lord Jesus, speaking of his Father, speaking about the Almighty God who is a spirit, he, he has a house. What, what does that mean? What is it for? And Jesus says, in my Father's house, his abode, there are many mansions, there are many dwelling places. It's, there's more there than just for him. There is space for all of Jesus' followers as well. And while he is away, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And by extension, all of those who will one day be the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. These dwellings are abodes in the Father's house. When he's speaking about the Father's house, he's not using a phrase that talks about the temple in Jerusalem. You see in John chapter 2 that Jesus talks about my, my house, my father's house, is to be a, a place of prayer, right? But the context of John 14 has nothing to do with the temple in Jerusalem. He's going to go to the father. He's going to leave the world and go to the father's house. This is another father's house from the temple in Jerusalem. And he is not talking either about his own body. In John chapter 2, Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll build it back. And the commentary in John in the text says that he was speaking about his own body and about his resurrection. So there's a sense in which Jesus can refer to his own body as a kind of temple. But that's not the context of John 14 either. It's very clear from the passage that Jesus is talking about leaving this world and going to the Father's house, which is away from this world. And in that 
place, there are many abodes which Jesus is going to prepare. You say, well, how is he going to do that? Does he have a building contract? Uh, there are no details given here about how he's going to do it. Maybe some of the factors involved in his creating a dwelling place relate to our own life of obedience. I think about 1 Timothy chapter 6, which says that those who have means in this world are to be generous and to use what God has given them to multiply the gospel and to see the church advanced. And by doing this, they build up a foundation for the future. Could it be that the decisions that you and I make this week are part of what is going to be the furnishings, uh, an aspect of that eternal dwelling place? I, I wonder. I'm speculating a little bit, but it's a, a possibility. So is this going to be a permanent arrangement? The text tells us that Jesus' departure is a temporary measure. He is going to come back. Verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, it doesn't say I'm going to stay there forever. He says to his disciples, I will come again and the purpose of that will be to receive his followers to himself. He is going to return. He is going to, in his glorified body, depart from this world at the ascension, which liturgical churches remember this week, the 9th of May, the day of ascension, where Christ bodily ascends into the presence of the Father. And he says, I'm going to return. Acts chapter 1 shows us through the declaration of the angels to the first uh, uh, believers before Pentecost, that in the same way that Jesus was caught up into heaven, in the same way he is going to return. He went up bodily, he's going to return bodily. There's going to be a bodily, physical return. I will come again. And the purpose for his return is to receive his followers unto himself. And then he says that the result of this will be permanent fellowship with Christ. That where I am, there ye may be also. So instead of him being with the Father, visibly, I should say, invisibly present, he is present by His Spirit today among us and in us, but we can't see Jesus. We can't make an appointment to go listen to Him preach somewhere. He doesn't hold conferences in, in one city and then move to another city. Jesus is physically at the right hand of Father in a glorified body, and he, he, we can't interact with Him personally in the way that we're speaking to one another this evening. But one day He is going to return, and it will be possible for us to see him as he is and to interact with him face to face. And once Jesus takes us to be with himself, wherever he goes, we go. We will always be with the Lord. This is exciting news. You know, there's some people that you know, that we know, where if they said to us, I will always be with you, we would say, maybe you'd like to think about that again? <laughs> um, g give me a little space. You know the proverb that says that it is not a good thing always to be in, you know, knocking on your neighbor's door? Because people need a little bit of privacy. But when this happens, there will no longer be any need of privacy if you prefer privacy. It will be a joy always to be with the Lord and we will want nothing better than that. That's Jesus' prediction of his return. And this information should serve to comfort the disciples. Chapter 14, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You already trust in God. Trust me too about this point 
that in my father's house are many dwelling places. I'm going to go there and I'm going to re prepare a place for you. It's going to be an individual place that is suited to every one of my followers. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you may be also. Christ unfolded the reality of this event, which is a completely new thing, never before revealed in biblical history. Because when you look at the predictions in the Old Testament of the coming of the Messiah to, to dwell on the earth and to rule in judgment, there is a different focus. What happens when Christ comes in judgment is an awe-inspiring thing. And that's not what Jesus is speaking about here. Now, this, of course, raises a question. Um, shall we say, a problem. What did Jesus mean when he said he is coming again? Is the coming already behind us? Has, he, has Jesus already come back? Or are we still waiting for it? Now there are, as far as I can see, five possible interpretations of this statement. I am going to come again, verse 3. I will come again and receive you unto myself. These are five solutions to the question, five answers to the question that have been proposed by Bible students as they look at this passage and related passages. Here's one of them. I will come again refers to the believer's death. The proposal is, I'm thinking about uh, scholars like J. Barton Payne, who's a well-known uh, historic premillennialist and post-tribulationist, if you're interested in some more specifics, who lived during the 20th century and was a theology professor in Chicago. He said that when the believer dies, he goes to the mansions above which Jesus uh, has prepared for him, and that is Jesus' coming for him. What do you think? That's a rhetorical question. If you look carefully at the passage, verse 3 says, I will come, what's the next word? Again. again. And that word is important, palin. I will come again means that as I have left, so I will return in the same way. And when a believer dies and is with the Lord, Christ does not come again as he left. This is not a repetition of the ascension. If we could say that it is a coming again, then it would be Jesus comes again and 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 again. Every time a believer dies, Jesus is coming back again. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the passage. And furthermore, the, the pronoun you here, um, I will come again and receive you unto myself, is a plural pronoun. It's not singular. And so the reception is made of the group, not of an individual. Coming again is the counterpoint to I'm going away. In the account of Stephen's martyrdom in Acts chapter 7, you remember how uh, Stephen uh, gives this um, grilling, asado kind of speech to the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and tells them that they're putting their trust in their relationship to Moses and they believe in the law and they believe that the temple is some kind of a sacred place that has it's kind of a magic potion, and all the world needs to come to the sacred temple, uh, and then everything will be just perfect. And at the end, they decide to stone him. And the account tells us in Acts 7.56 that Jesus does not come to Stephen, but stands at the right hand of the Father to receive Stephen to himself. But he does not come. The, the language is it's quite specific there. Jesus does not come back, does not come again when the believer goes to be with Christ. 
And in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, believers go to be with the Lord at death. The Lord does not come to take us to heaven. If you want to look at uh, other references, you can see that um, when Jesus talks about people dying, uh, it seems that the angels are involved in taking the soul or the immaterial aspect of a person into the Lord's presence when he talks about the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Now, I don't think we can accept this option. Here's a second one. I will come again is a reference to salvation. When Jesus comes again, it happens when you put your trust in the gospel. Jesus comes to you. But don't forget that little word again in the passage, which is there for a reason. I'm going to be taken out of this world and I'm going to return. And so you really have to allegorize, spiritualize the text to mm, twist it and pull it in every direction to just fit what you'd like the text to say. The coming again of Jesus is linked to his physical departure from the disciples in order to go to the Father. And so this allegorical approach is not a good one to adopt. There's a third possibility, and that is that when Jesus says, I'm going to come again, he's referring to his resurrection from the dead. We see in John chapter 20, verse 19, that Jesus came to his disciples on resurrection day. So maybe when Jesus says, I'm coming again, he's referring to when he comes back from the grave. But this interpretation gives us a chronological problem. Because in John 14, Jesus goes to the Father that happens at the ascension. After which he comes again to the disciples. If Jesus' resurrection is the fulfillment of this, then Jesus would first come back from the tomb and then go to the Father. That's not what he said in the text. The passage cannot refer to John 20, verse 19. Jesus' resurrection was not his return from the Father, and he did not take the disciples to be with himself in a place that he had prepared for them when Jesus rose from the dead. Here is a fourth possibility that you will find in um, various commentaries that come um, in the tradition of the Swiss Reformed. I looked at Frédéric Godet in his commentary on John's Gospel. Godet was a Swiss theologian in the 19th century, and he's got a tome on the Gospel of John that's this thick. I mean, it is a real pavé. It's a, you know, how do you say that in English? Uh, sorry, if I flip uh, into French once in a while, it is a stone that you put in the middle of the street, paving stone. It is a huge tome. Frédéric Godet was a careful scholar, and uh, this is um, what he proposed. And uh, you find this also if you look often at um, uh, websites, you will find the NET Bible which states that if in the imagery of the fourth gospel the phrase in my father's house is ultimately a reference to Jesus' body, then the relationship of mone to meno, that is a dwelling place, suggests the permanent relationship of the believer to Jesus and the father as an adopted son who remains in the household forever. In this case, the dwelling place is in Jesus himself, where he is, whether in heaven or on earth. The statement in verse 3, I will come again and receive you to myself, then refers not just to the, the return of Christ, the parousia, but also to Jesus' post-resurrection return to the disciples in his glorified state, when by virtue of his death on their behalf they may enter into union with him and with the Father as adopted sons. Or Robert Gundry says, he is going to prepare for them spiritual abodes within his own person. 
So according to this interpretation, to be taken into dwelling places it has to do with being in Christ, being associated with Jesus. But you know, this interpretation doesn't match the language that Jesus uses in the text. He says, I will receive you unto myself. The language expresses a physical motion from a place where you're distant to a place where you're close. So that if the departure was visible and bodily, then the reappearing will be bodily as well. And when the Holy Spirit came, the believers received Jesus by His Spirit, but they were not received into the Father's household. I should say into the Father's house. Let's not use the word household. He's talking here about the dwelling of God, the, 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 my Father's house. There is a household, a community of faith, which is different from the Father's house in heaven. And if Jesus' reference to the Father's house is his own body, then how can he say that he is going away essentially to himself? This is as contradictory as saying that at the inauguration of the Lord's table, Jesus lifted the bread and said, this is my body. If this was literally true, then the piece of bread that he held in his hand was actually an extension of his human body, which is certainly not true. So when Jesus says, when I come back, I'm going to receive you to myself, he's not speaking metaphorically, he's talking about an actual physical movement from where the disciples are to the place where the Father is. Jesus in his body cannot go to himself. I will receive you to myself. If that means that the disciples are already part of Jesus spiritually, then Jesus is receiving himself to himself, which is absurd. That doesn't make any sense. Jesus in his body cannot go to himself, the Father's house, to prepare dwelling places for the disciples. He is leaving the location of the earth and going to be with the Father in heaven at the ascension from which he will later return to take the disciples to himself. Now it's very interesting to look through John 14, 15, and 16 and see the uh, variety of passages where Jesus uses the language of coming. And you know, one of the wonderful things about the fact that Jesus is in heaven is that he, he said, D don't be troubled by this. Um, you know, when we interact with people whom we really love and someone says, I'm going to be going away for a long time. Think about missionaries in the 18th century who left England to go to China or to India and they said goodbye to their loved ones, and their loved ones knew they would probably never see them again. If you're the missionary, you will probably say, don't be troubled. Um, this is for a good cause. But you may not be able to say with any assurance, I'm coming back soon. Because your departure may very well be definitive. Jesus says, do not be troubled when I say I'm going away to a place where you cannot come now. I'm going to the Father's house, but I'm going to come back. And in the intermediate time, Jesus says, not only don't be troubled that my departure is permanent, but while I'm away, not only am I, play, am I preparing dwelling places for my followers in the Father's house, but I'm going to send my spirit so that you are not going to be left orphans. Jesus, by His Spirit, is present everywhere around the world at the same time to continue some of the work that He was doing when He was physically present. He abides in the believer, and He draws us to Himself, and He convicts us of our need, and He ministers to us by His Spirit in a unique way. That's a tremendous blessing. And Jesus says in John 16, 7, I have to go away so that I can send the Spirit to the disciples. 
So his departure actually is a good thing, not just because what we can look forward to in the future, but because actually we have a certain advantage today as believers in Christ to have Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for us and having his spirit present in every local church and every believer's own inner person at the same time, uh, because if that were not the case, we would be quite frustrated that we might only interact with Jesus once in a lifetime. Do you have the means to go back and forth to Galilee or Jerusalem on a weekly basis to listen to him preach? He can't hold conferences in every place at the same time because Jesus has a glorified body which, is, which has a location. And Jesus will always have a human body as a descendant of King David, glorified for sure, and yet having a local center. Jesus is omnipresent as God in a certain sense, but he also is locally present. And I'm not sure I understand, I'm sure I don't understand how that all fits together, but Jesus will always, as a God-man, be omnipresent and locally present at the same time. And so having the Holy Spirit with us and in us is a tremendous advantage. And Jesus has not left us as orphans. But he says repeatedly in John 16 that they're going to see him again. Look at John 16 and verse 16. A little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me because I go to the Father. Verse 17. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I should go to the Father. You know, they're muttering to each other around the table. Which please come They said, therefore, uh, what is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Verse 19, now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Look at verse 28. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Notice the geographic switch. This is not about the coming of the Spirit. He's talking about, I came from the Father from heaven. I'm here materially among you. I'm going back to my Father. There's a change of location. Chapter 17, verse 24, in Jesus' high priestly prayer. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. When we're with the Lord Jesus in his presence, we will see him as he is. None of us can imagine what that's going to be like, except there is a little clue in Revelation chapter 1 where the Apostle John sees the Lord Jesus in his glorified body and falls flat on his face. And all of us are going to have to do that. It's going to be overwhelming. But Jesus is going to take us by the hand as he took John's hand and said, stand up because we can stand in his presence because of the work that Jesus has done for us once for all at the cross <clears throat> to purify us from our sin. And so the conclusion that I would defend is that in this passage in John 14, Jesus is talking about his return for the church. I'm going to come again. It's not referring to the believer's death. It's not referring to the resurrection. 
It's not referring to the point of salvation. It's not referring to the coming of the Spirit. It is referring to His return for the church. Now, quickly, let me go on to a couple of other things here, and we'll try to move through this fairly quickly. There's a very interesting analogy that we see used in Scripture to refer to the Lord Jesus' return. And Reynold Showers, who uh, is, was a, a Jewish Bible teacher now with the Lord, an uh, interesting man who spent uh, many years ministering in various churches to talk about these themes, and uh, uh, died just a couple of years ago, lived for some time in the same retirement center, actually, as my dad lives in, um, did quite a bit of work looking at the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia at the marriage customs of the first century. And he notes some striking parallels between what is referred to in John 14 and 1 Thessalonians 4 and the Jewish marriage customs. A groom initiates a marriage covenant with his bride. He proposes marriage to her. And then he seals this proposal by drinking a cup, of, a cup of wine with the bride's father. The deal is sealed. You are now bound to this woman. She is spoken for. She is set apart exclusively for this man who has proposed marriage to her. The groom now leaves the bride, and he goes to his father's home for up to 12 months to prepare a place where the married couple is going to be able to live a little later on. He's going to prepare the bridal chamber. She is going to be able to prepare her dowry, and uh, it's going to take sometimes up to 12 months, a full year, to make these arrangements. No credit cards, no debit cards. Uh, no long-term investments. This was a much more difficult in those days to, to get together. The question, question, of course, that would be raised during this lengthy period of absence uh, without an iPhone is, will the parties be loyal to one another and how are they going to communicate? They might be separated by some significant distance. After all the preparations are made, the groom returns for the bride and he doesn't tell her in advance when he's coming. Usually he does this at night, and he gets his bridal party together, and uh, they make a lot of noise in the street, and there's a shout, the bridegroom's arrived! I would say it in Hebrew, of course. And the woman has maybe some sense that the time's probably getting close, so she better be ready for his coming, but she doesn't know exactly when it's going to be. The shouts are in the streets, and this lady is going to be veiled as she uh, goes with her husband to the groom's father, and uh, there is a huppa, a bridal chamber that has been established in the father's house just for this purpose. They're going to hide out there for seven days, and they consummate the marriage by physical union, and this is announced to the wedding party who is waiting outside we don't do things like this in Western Europe, but that's the way it was done in the first century. And um, after the marriage is consummated, they stay in the hupa for a, a whole week. I guess they have lots to talk about. The wedding party is in another part of the house, and they're feasting and uh, exchanging news and having a grand time of it. And this week-long feast is going to be concluded <clears throat> by um, the exit of the couple from the hupa, The uh, bride now is without the veil. She is presented to the wedding guests, wedding guests. And I don't know if they say, oh, that's who it is. Probably not, but they're going to be able to see who it is. And uh, she is going to um, be able to talk to all the wedding guests. And there is no more question about whom this chap married. Now, what is also interesting is to look at 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. I don't know if you can see my pointer, the passage which we will look at next week. 
and see some parallels between John 14, 1 to 3 and 1 Thess 4. A uh, gentleman by the name of J.D. Smith, who was a Mennonite commentator, uh, noted the similarity of language between John 14, 1 to 3 and 1 Thessalonians 4, which is written by the Apostle Paul. And what I've tried to do is make this easier to follow and see how the language that's used is paralleled by the language that Paul uses in the letter we'll look at next time we're together. Let not your heart be troubled. Comfort one another with these words. Ye believe. that There's a reference to believing something about God and something about Jesus. There is a reference to Christ in both cases, which we would expect. He's called the Lord. And um, there's, there's revelation that is given in both cases. There's a war, word that is given by Christ. And Paul is referring to the word of the Lord, perhaps referring back to the passage in John 14. He talks about his coming again. The Lord himself shall descend. And he says, I will receive you unto myself. Those who are in Christ and who are not dead, but remain until the time when Christ returns, will be caught up together with the, the departed dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. There is an interesting parallel that where I am, there ye may be also. We shall ever be with the Lord. What's interesting to note is that if you take Revelation 19, which talks about the return of Christ in power and glory to rule and reign, you find that the language is extremely different. There is a tone of triumph, and it, it's militant, and there's no mention there of comfort. The church comes back with Christ to rule and to reign, but the context is very different, and that's something that we should take time to think about. John chapter 14, 1 to 3 is designed to deal with the reality of anxiety in the believer's life. Are you an anxious person? Do you wake up in the morning and listen to, I don't know what you listen to, RVT, uh, uh, World Service, we listen to the British World Service. Uh, we haven't found a whole lot that's better to listen to. It used to be much more worthwhile to listen to the World Service than it is today, but it kind of gives us an idea of what's going on. I, I, mean, there, there, I can't remember the last time that on the, the World Service there was a piece of good news. Can you mention something? It's all bad news. I suppose that's what makes them money. But there's a lot that's going on in the world today that can make us anxious. And there was a lot that was going on during that week of the Lord Jesus' betrayal and denial and crucifixion and burial that would have caused the disciples to be anxious. In fact, they were not just anxious, they were drop-dead fearful. Go to the upper room, close the door, lock it, bar it. We don't want to be the next people to be crucified. Talk about hand-wringing. And Jesus says, before all of that happens, don't let your heart be troubled. Just, we would say today, chill. <laughs> be calm, be collected. Do not let yourself all get tied up in a knot about the things that are going to happen. Because, although I'm going to, wait, to go away to the Father's house, I'm going to prepare something for you that's far beyond what you could ever imagine. And my departure is temporary. I'm coming back, and I'm going to take you to myself. And after I take you to be with myself, you're going to always be with me. There will be no more goodbyes, no more departures, no sadness, no crying. The scriptures tell us that the church is going to return with Christ to reign with him. We'll see that next time in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, and related passages. And wherever Jesus goes, we will accompany him. We will be functioning as his bride. 
do not be troubled. That is a recurring theme in John 14. John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Chapter 16, verse 20, verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the, and the, the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Verse 22, ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh away from you. Verse 24, hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask that ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Verse 33, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. No match. Although Jesus has not yet gone to the cross and Satan has not yet been defeated, he can use the past tense because it is so certain to happen that he can speak of it as a completed act. I have overcome the world. No other signs are mentioned to precede his return. The imminency of Jesus' return for the church is a goad for us to a way of living, isn't it? And you know, the average tourist on the beast, uh, the beast, on the beach <laughs> here in Andalusia has no notion of this. If you come for a holiday to Ben Almadena or Torre Molinos, you're not thinking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe your heart is troubled and you just go to the bar and drink it all away or go to the disco and uh, bailar it all away. And that's foolishness. Because our confidence is in Jesus Christ, the Lord. We live for him. We live in this expectancy of his return. And it could be this week. There are no signs that must be fulfilled before Jesus returns to take the church out of the world. That's the notion of the rapture, the catching out, the arpazzo, if you will, of the church, the snatch. And if we believe this is true, it affects the way we live. It affects our priorities. It affects our attitude. It gives us joy and anticipation. May this be true of us as we go into this week, that we anticipate that Jesus is going to make good on what he has said. I believe in the rapture. I hope you do. And we're going to talk some more about when that occurs and how it occurs and more things about it from other passages to give us a little larger uh, perspective on it. Point one, though, is that Jesus is the one to first talk about it. And there'll be more information coming down the road for us in coming weeks. Thank you, Father, for giving us these chapters in the Bible that give us hope and confidence as we go into this week. It would be wonderful if this week the Lord Jesus did come back for his own. If he does, we want to be ready. If he delays, we want to live for you with that expectancy. Help us to do this for the honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.